You guys ready? Okay, well, got a full house tonight, so good evening everyone and welcome to the uh, town board meeting. Today's Monday, August 26th. Uh, please join me, oh, 22nd, excuse me. Uh, please uh, join me well. We pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, well, we have a, a very full agenda and a lot of people he, who are here uh, to speak on either public hearings um, or making public comment on the an proposed Anderson Group home. So uh, the first order of business is to um, seek a motion to accept the minutes of the July 18th meeting. So moved. And Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so we have three public hearings uh, on the agenda tonight, and I'm going to ask um, our clerk to go ahead and read the public hearing notice for local law I, the solar energy systems. Please take notice that the Town Board of the Town of Hyde Park will hold a public hearing on the adoption of proposed local law I of the year 2016, entitled a local law amending the town code to establish a new chapter 130 entitled Solar Energy Systems and Facilities, and to amend the schedule of use regulations to provide for those facilities on August 22, 2016 at 7.05 p.m. at the Hyde Park Town Hall, 4383 Albany Post Road, Hyde Park, New York. The purpose of the local law is to allow for and regulate the installation of rooftop and ground mounted solar systems, mm -hmm. solar farms, building integrated photobiotic systems and thermal systems in the town of Hyde Park. A copy of said local law is available for review at the town clerk's office during regular business hours. All persons desiring to be heard on the adoption of said local law shall be given an opportunity to do so at said public hearing. By order of the town board of the town of Hyde Park, dated July 13, 2016, Hyde Park, New York, Donna McGrogan, town clerk. <clears throat> Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, Warren, do you want to just give a little bit of an update on our, our solar law? Sure. I mean, basically, the, the gist of the law is uh, in uh, chapter, uh, section 130-4. Um, and uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, and what the law does is, is permits um, the town to regulate and, and permit um, rooftop and ground mounted solar facilities for private residents um, and for commercial uh, facilities and to allow for what we call solar farms. Um, solar farms are larger uh, facilities uh, in which uh, the um, um, uh, larger scale solar facilities are established on a piece of property and um, the um, uh, energy that's uh, uh, generated by that is sold and or passed back onto the grid um, as the case may be. Um, and section 130-4 uh, basically states that uh, rooftop or building mounted solar systems shall be permitted in all zoning districts pursuant to a solar system building permit granted by the town's building inspector and zoning enforcement officer and subject to the requirements of the article and there are provisions in the um, um, in this in the law um, regulating the uh, requirements for freestanding uh, for for rooftop and for freestanding uh, um, solar systems uh, rooftop or building mounted solar systems which are to be located in the town's um, historic overlay or, or scenic district shall in addition to a solar building um, system permit require site plan approval by the planning board. Uh, the board felt that in these districts, more oversight needed to be um, uh, provided for the uh, approval of those types of systems in those districts. Uh, Freestanding or ground mounted solar systems shall be permitted in all zoning districts subject to the is issuance of a solar system building permit and site plan approval by the planning board. Solar farms shall be permitted only in the Greenbelt mm -hmm. District subject to a solar system building permit and special use permit and site plan approval by the planning board. Uh, those are, will be subject to a much more rigorous um, approval process. Um, building integrated uh, 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 photovolactic um, systems are permitted in all zoning districts provided 
uh, that those systems are shown on plans submitted for the building permit application for the building containing the system approved by the town's building inspector. inspector. Uh, solar uh, thermal systems are permitted in all zoning districts uh, subject to the conditions set forth herein, and there are some provisions relating to that. So basically that's what the solar law provides for, and it's been out for public review, and if there's any comments on it, uh, we'll take those comments tonight. Okay. So uh, may I have a motion then to open the public uh, hearing on this local law? So moved. And a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so would anyone in the public like to come on up and speak on our local law I, solar energy systems? Um, just a reminder, uh, if everyone uh, states their name and their address and limits their comments to three minutes, and that applies to the public hearings as well as the public comment. Good evening, Supervisor Rohr, Town Board. How are you doing tonight? Good. How are you? Mike Athanas. I'm on 1487 Route 9G. I guess I'm the guilty party here. I started this local solar law. I have a proposed project for my farm, for our farm solar arrays. And I would just like to say that it's, it's a good thing for High Park. I've thought about this and I've gone to many other solar conferences in the Hudson Valley. They're, they're all over the area now. Every town is having a meeting. And uh, more or less it is a great thing for the Hudson Valley. It seems like I went to one last night. They say the Hudson Valley is the hotbed right now for New York for solar energy. And uh, Wappingers, town of Wappingers, there's a group down there called the Solarize Hudson Valley. They're promoting uh, rooftop and low income uh, solar for people that aren't aware of how feasible and available it is. So this is a group of volunteers. They're not getting paid. They're just going out there and, and trying to get people involved with it. I'm not trying to promote Wappingers, but it's uh, solar is a very good thing. Uh, it's good for the environment. Once it's up, it won't pollute. There's absolutely no pollution from it. There's no noise from it. There's no runoff uh, other than the rain coming down. And uh, one of the things it will do, it'll help maintain my farm. The, the forests on the farm and the rest of the farm will be sustainable with the, with the extra income coming off of this project and I'll be able to keep the farm going. The farm is almost in the family for 100 years now. We're almost a centennial farm. So I'd like to see it become a centennial farm. And it will really help the residents of High Park because it will give It'll put into the grid cheaper electric, and there are organizations in the area that want people to buy less expensive electric. So the residents will save on their electric bill, and the town will get increased tax money for the uh, commercial use of the ground. So it's really a, a very good win-win situation. I hope it does pass. I can't really see too much wrong with it. The panels uh, will be on stall on my farm will not be seen from 9G. If you don't know they're there, you'll never see them. A few people in Green Street Park will see uh, the edge of some of the panels. It's about two or three houses. Uh, right now, I was in the field where the proposed one of the sites is, and you really can't even see the houses through the hedgerow uh, because of the brush that's growing there. Winter time, of course, the brush, will be, there won't be any leaves, but if we need to put up a vanity uh, fence of some kind of a evergreen, that's quite doable. So it's a very good thing, I think, for Hyde Park, and I, I hope it does pass. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Thanos. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Madam Supervisor and town board members. Uh, my name is James Horan. I'm an attorney. Um, I represent uh, Mr. Athanas as well as um, a solar um, d developer for solar farms. Um, we've met several times with uh, um, Tad Moss and other members of, uh, we met with the, some planning board members and we've had um, uh, a proposal that was received uh, quite well. I commend the, the town board on, on the work they've done. 
on the solar law. Um, I think it's a very uh, important thing uh, to move uh, solar uh, forward in the town of Hyde Park, particularly the larger scale projects. Um, as Mr. Rathana said, um, many farms uh, see this as a, a very um, useful, steady income stream to maintain the farms. Um, you don't, it's not dependent on weather. Uh, uh, it's not dependent on uh, rain. Uh, so um, many farmers have been receptive to uh, solar companies coming out. Also, um, there's a number of large uh, properties throughout the town in the Greenbelt District um, that because of various um, land use constraints make them very difficult to develop. Um, in developing solar farms, you don't need uh, roads, you don't need uh, sewer systems, water systems. So as far as being environmentally friendly, um, there's not a lot of infrastructure that's associated with them. Um, so once um, you put the solar farms in, there's not a whole lot of economic, di uh, environmental disturbance. Um, so um, you're able to use uh, properties that otherwise may not be able to be used other, um, un under different uh, conditions because of, be it steep slopes or wetlands and things of that sort. Just a couple of comments with respect to the law that was drafted. Um, in the definition of small-scale solar, it limits the, uh, the application of small-scale solar up to 10 kilowatts. NYSERDA has a New York State uniform, uh, unified permit process, uh, which uh, I would suggest to the town that it, it use uh, that process, um, which deals with the installation of solar panels on existing buildings on their roofs. And in that process, the NYSERDA recommends that the limit be 12 kilowatts instead of 10 kilowatts. Um, also, in section 130-6, um, there's a discussion of ground-mounted solar panels, which talks about them not being allowed in a front yard, which would apply only in the case of an accessory use where there's an existing building on the lot. In the case where you have a vacant field with no buildings on it, um, there is no front yard. So it's unclear how it would be treated in a situation where there's no buildings on the lot and the solar farm is a principal use. So I would suggest that the town board take care of that. Um, with respect to 130-8B, um, it discusses um, for particular with solar farms, fencing and uh, warning signs on the property with respect to the installer or the manufacturer of the equipment. Um, these solar farms are, typically have a 20 year life. So out five or 10 years, the installer and manufacturer of the, of the panels may not necessarily be relevant. Um, it may be better off to have a contact information for the owner um, of, of, the, of the facility. And lastly, 130-8H um, talks about that the planning board shall require a bond to remove the solar panel installation, the solar form installation at the end of its useful life. Um, again, these are 20 to 25 year projects. So there would be a bond kicking around in town hall for 20 to 25 years, which would be somewhat difficult to maintain. Um, I also wonder how easy it would be for a developer to get a bond that would be in place for 25 years. I think that rather than shall and make it mandatory, I think some option other than a performance bond to with to remove the, the panel at the end of its useful life would be more appropriate, perhaps a, a deed restriction on the property um, or something along those lines where if, if the installation is not removed, the town could take it upon itself, remove the solar farm and um, charge it back against the property, I think might be more um, workable than a bond for 25 years. Um, I'll put those, I, my understanding is there's no resolution on this evening to adopt no, this. So I'll put those comments in writing Perfect. and submit them. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. My name is Surin Misra. I live on 117 Forest Drive and I have a piece of land and there is a proposal for a solar farm. 
Um, I believe it's a good thing for my land. Um, I can keep my land open. And ecologically, it is, it is very um, good thing to do rather than I do anything else. So there won't be much alterations on the land except there will be solar farm. It can be dismelted any time. So it's a nice thing. And it will give me some money to keep the land. Otherwise, very difficult. So sustain, sustainability, I think town should think about it for the open land. And that's how we can keep it. Otherwise, very difficult. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Mr. Misra. Hi, my name is Ann Whaling, and I work with Cypress Creek Renewables. We're a solar developer. I live in New York. Um, I just have a few comments. The first thing is more of a request for clarification. Uh, in section 130-6, there's a little line that says solar collectors should be situated so as to reasonably minimize blockage for surrounding properties, but it doesn't say what kind. Is this for access or view shed or sunlight? So a little clarification there would probably be helpful. Um, I have a comment similar to uh, the gentleman that just spoke with regard to the decommissioning bond. Um, a bond costs approximately 20% to attain, and it's usually based on the total installed value and cost of the project, which is about $3 million for a 20-acre commercial-scale solar farm. That would be $60,000. We had a New York State licensed engineer take an estimate of what it would cost to remove the panels and put it against what the presumed salvage value of the project would be. and. Uh, the salvage value of the panels, even if you don't take into consideration the fact that they're probably still working after 20 years and producing power, um, far exceeds the removal cost. Just so you'll know, uh, I can provide you with a copy of that if you're interested. But uh, the salvage value of the steel, the copper, and the panels themselves is very high. Um, the removal process doesn't involve cranes. It'll probably only take a couple of weeks and some trucks, and most of the stuff can be either salvaged or disposed just in a landfill because it's inert. So. Um, in some towns, they've taken an approach to this where the attorney can look at the project, the town attorney, and sort of set some decommissioning cost account. Um, for example, I think Socrates uses this. Uh, the town of Rochester has a, a rigorous notification program for decommissioning, which allows and requires the project developer to maintain an address on file with the town and to update that address every year so that you always know who to contact and who to go after, who to find if you need to, to take some action in that regard. And again, that, the other two proposals, um, you know, some deed restriction or um, other means would be infinitely preferable and probably more than adequate to address that concern. Um, my third comment is simply that the current draft allows for solar development on the utility scale in the Greenbelt zone only. Um, and you've created, you know, I think you've given the planning board a lot of discretion in this process, a good, a good amount, some standard, you know, some uh, special use permit, the site plan application and everything. I would just ask you to maybe consider on a case-by-case -case basis whether there might be sites such as Mr. Misra's that are really appropriate for solar because our site selection heavily depends on access to interconnect. I mean, it's the single driving factor really behind our decision of where to site solar, um, solar farms. And there are really, we've looked real hard in this area and we've only found three areas that we like the interconnect enough that we would pursue the project. And two of them are in Greenbelt, but one of them is not. And so if you had a site that was not land constrained, you know, maybe 70 acres, and offered, you know, good camouflage and <coughs> an absence from, you know, homes. If it's sort of a rural district, maybe that might be something that you would want to give the planning board some discretion to pursue, at least, you know, to explore. I don't know if that's the case or not, but I would appreciate you hearing about it anyway. Um, thanks. That's all my comments. I'll be happy to provide a copy in writing Thank if you'd you. like. That'd be great. Thank okay. you very thanks. much. Uh, would anyone else like to speak on the solar law, proposed solar law? Okay. Um, do you think we should continue the public I hearing? Sure. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, if I'd like to... Uh, if I oh. may, could I just make one quick sure. comment? Mm -hmm. um, just one other thing that the board should be aware of is that the solar industry is very heavily driven by tax incentives, mm -hmm. which typically change almost month to month um, because a lot of it is based on um, how much money that the federal government and the state government still have available. 
So one of the things is that um, should the board act, I, I would urge the board to act rather quickly um, because um, in order to take advantage of the solar credits that's available um, in this remaining calendar year, the projects would have to start. And then once you get into the next fiscal year, you're subject to the vagaries of Washington, particularly in this election season. God only knows what that means. Mm -hmm. So I just okay. wanted to put that out Thank on the record. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so uh, we will continue the public hearing yes. to uh, um, September. I would like to do it for the later okay. meeting in September because um, there were a couple of comments by the planning board that I, I may have to put in here. Okay. And I want to take a look at that. Jim, if you can send me a copy of your comments. Sure. Get me a copy. Oh, she is. Get me a copy of your comments. We'll take a look at them, but uh, we're we're planning on moving this forward fairly quickly. I'd anticipate we'd have something uh, passed by October. I'd like to take off the agenda the um, uh, Environmental Assessment Form 2 and 3, and we'll okay. do that at the next meeting also. Okay. Um, just so we can have the full law in place before we do that. Okay. So are you thinking then uh, that we will continue the public hearing till the 26th? Yeah. On the, on the, uh, yeah. yeah. Why don't we, uh, what's the first meeting? Uh, the first is the 12th. It's going to be tight for me. Get uh, let's put it on the agenda for the... Uh, for the 26th. 26. Yeah. And you'll have the have, re revised law gonna, to us we're before that. We're discuss it. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Sounds good. Just uh, to speak to one of the um, um, points that Mr. Horan and Ms. Whalen said uh, regarding deed restrictions, uh, they're not enforceable by the town. So it just doesn't make sense for us to use that as one of the parameters. Uh, but I, I do. Um, take to heart the recommendation regarding uh, the difficulty in tracking a bond, but the town doesn't enforce deed restrictions, so I don't see how that would actually be a mechanism to control that. No, I, 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 there may be, I, the point is well taken on the bond. Okay, okay, um, yes, and, I agree. Um, but I'm going to take a look at uh, Rochester's law and see if we can come up with an alternative for that, because Bonds are very difficult to get. I agree. Uh, unless you're in the. Uh, and they're difficult to maintain in the and track. And they're yeah. difficult. So if there's a solution that works for the town, we'll, we'll try. Definitely. To uh, just with respect, uh, rather than rather than I misspoke with respect to a deed restriction. What's typically done, particularly with respect to stormwater maintenance facilities, there's an agreement that's entered into between the town and the property owner that gets recorded in the chain of title, I which think. specifically. Okay. So well, that that, makes sense. that would. Rather than a deed restriction per okay. se, that's great. the mechanism. Well, we that I would okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, setting continuing. Okay, so I need a motion to continue the public hearing till the 26th of September. So moved. And second. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Can I just mention? I know this is a, an industry that's changing rapidly, and um, <coughs> I. I I think for all the reasons that have been stated that it's a, a, a worthwhile thing for us to pursue. And it might be the kind of thing where we might have to just revisit it in a year and make any updates based on the changing industry. And that's, that's I think that's a very good point. Just something that so we're trying to get out ahead of it right. as, as our uh, number of residents spoke about. And, and like you say, we may have to revise it in light of new of changes. Okay, so um, moving on then to our second uh, public hearing. Um, Madam Clerk, could you please read the public hearing notice for Local Law J stale applications? Please take notice that the High Park <coughs> Town Board has scheduled a public <coughs> hearing on the adoption of Local Law J of 2016, entitled Local Law Amending Chapter 108 of the Town Code to provide for the abandonment of certain stale applications before the Town of Hyde Park Planning Board for August 22, 2016 at 7.05 p.m. at the Hyde Park Town Hall, 4383 Albany Post Road, Hyde Park, New York. Any person desiring to be heard on the adoption of said local law shall be permitted to do so at said public hearing. A copy of said local law is available for inspection at the town clerk's office during regular business hours and on the town's official website and notice board. By order of the town board, dated July 18th, 2016, Hyde Park, New York, Donna McGrogan, town clerk. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so, Warren, do you want to just kind of give us an update? I know we've been talking about sure, this. Sure, I think we've talked about it a couple of times. 
uh, but uh, the genesis of this law was a request by the planning board uh, because they've had situations where certain applications for um, site plan approval uh, or for uh, PUDs and other applications um, uh, just become stale before the planning board and you don't hear from the developer. Sometimes they come in and uh, ask for an extensions uh, and those are granted. Sometimes they don't um, and they just sit out there for a long period of time. And this permits the, uh, these changes permit the <coughs> planning board to have oversight over these applications. So if they become stale, um, the planning board can notify the, uh, the applicant and require them to come in and move forward with the application. Uh, and if they don't, the planning board would have, on a case-by-case -case basis, the discretion to uh, deem the application to be withdrawn. I mean, the only penalty is that the uh, applicant would have to refile, but at least the planning board doesn't have this hanging out there in space somewhere. Um, it's my understanding that there's a couple of changes that the planning board wanted to make to the law which we haven't gotten yet from the planning board, so we're not going to pass or close the public hearing tonight. We're going to wait for the planning board uh, to get us uh, their comments, which I believe relate to subdivision applications. So this won't be the last time you can weigh in on this if you want to weigh in on it. Okay, so a motion to open the uh, public hearing on the local law chat. So moved. And a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, would anyone like to speak on the uh, local law regarding stale applications? Okay, uh, then may I have a motion to continue the public hearing to, shall we make it the 12th or the 22nd? Um, or 26th, I'm sorry. Let's do this for the 26th also because I'm okay. going to need time to uh, incorporate the, to changes. Incorporate the okay. changes. Okay, so moved. And uh, second? second? Second. And all in favor? So Aye. 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 So that will be uh, another public hearing for the 26th. <coughs> okay. Finally, uh, we do have a uh, another local law. That's the continuation of the local law H, the rural events law. And um, uh, Madam Clerk, could you go ahead and read that? It's um, a continuation. Oh, it's yeah, a continuation, so you don't have to read. Okay. Warren, do you want to give another update on why... Uh, Yes. We have revised it again and uh, another. This is a um, sort of a, a use that fell into uh, in between the cracks, and it's not an uncommon problem for a lot of municipalities, uh, where um, uh, properties are being used, especially historical properties or barns, are being used for um, wedding venues and similar um, uh, festivities of that type, um, and the town of Hyde Park really doesn't have. Uh, any provisions in its local in its uh, code to to deal with those uses to regulate those uses and they do need to be regulated because they can have an impact on neighboring properties in terms of noise and traffic um, so uh, we have worked very hard to try to develop a rural event venue uh, law which would permit uh, property owners in certain parts of the town uh, to come in and uh, get a, uh, an application approved by the planning board we would envision that it would be a one-time application um, and that they would describe the way they're going to conduct the, uh, the the events and where on the property and how parking is going to be accommodated and how um, um, solid waste will be managed. And um, uh, But we've amended the law a little bit after first introducing it um, to allow for some flexibility uh, that in the event that there is a change um, in the uh, um, proposed method of operation on a case-by-case -case basis uh, that they would have that materially conflicts with what the planning board uh, had approved that they would have to come back to the planning board but the way we envision it working is that there would be a one-time approval they would get the approval from the planning board then they'd have the ability to conduct these events as long as they're conducting them in accordance with the approvals of the planning board so there were some changes that were made to the law to address these issues so that's why it's still open <coughs> and um, 
those are the changes that we have in the current law. I just law. wanted to make a clarification in case there are people here tonight that haven't followed along with this. This only applies to um, when someone is renting out their property for use for events. This does not apply to people hosting a party or event on their own on their own property. That That's not regulated by this law. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear. This, this is, is for cases where folks are renting their property out, um, you know, over as a time commercial activity. As, a, as a commercial activity. That's correct. Okay, so um, may I have a motion then to open the public hearing on that rural event law? So moved. And a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Would anyone like to speak on the rural event law? <clears throat> okay. We can't vote on it tonight because um, it has to be, it's in final form now. Yeah. Um, but it has to be on your desk seven days before. So if we could adjourn, with this one, we could adjourn to the next town board meeting for an actual vote on it. So, but should we continue the public hearing then? Or? I don't think we need to I continue don't think the so. public well, hearing. Well, I think we have a resolution on our agenda yeah. to continue the public oh, hearing. Oh, can we do put that in? Yeah. So let's do yeah. that. Okay. Let's do, we okay. can close the public hearing at the And then, meeting. but we'll put a, uh, so we'll continue the public hearing right. to the 12th. I have it, well, the one I did was for the 26th. Mm -hmm. Um, why don't we just do it for the two? Oh, we'll okay. do all of them. We'll do all of them on the 26th. Okay. Okay, okay so um, I think that concludes our public hearings. Oh, okay, so um, actually we need a motion to continue the public hearing till the 26th. So moved. And a second. 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 And all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. <clears throat> So uh, that concludes our public hearing portion of the meeting. Uh, we'll now work on move on to our workshop discussions. Um, the July budget revisions um, are very straightforward. Our comptroller had in initially intended to stay uh, and workshop those, but they're not necessary. They're pretty very straightforward. Uh, we're taking the EAF solar law um, seeker parts two and three off the workshop. Do I, we don't need a motion to do that, do we? No. And then um, lastly, but not not least, we have a uh, recreation director, Kathleen Davis, here. Um, she's got a number of things that she's working on, so please join us, Kathleen. Uh, can we bring a... Um, oh. Oh, yeah. Joe, can you grab that and bring that over? Thanks, Kathleen, for coming out. Is that... Okay, well, I know you have a bunch of items that you want to update us on. Yes, so um, the Recreation Commission um, was recommending to go ahead with this um, Greenway Conservancy Trail Grant Program application for the Hyde Park Trail. And um, the grant application um, is available to um, municipalities, basically, and some non-for-profit corporations. So the Hyde Park Trail, everybody is probably familiar with, um, we're actually celebrating its 25th year this year. And um, so it's a series of trails that are on some of the town parks, like at Hackett Hill and Pinewoods, and some other uh, land conservancy properties within the town of Hyde Park. For instance, um, the Winnicky Land Trust Nature Preserve, um, the Scenic Hudson's um, uh, Dominican camp property up um, north um, of the town center, and um, the National Park Service trails at Vanderbilt and FDR. So um, we had um, put together, um, well, we are putting together um, a grant application um, based on the um, priorities for this funding um, program. And one of the um, categories that the 2016 grant includes funding is um, education interpretation projects, um, which include trail signage, trail kiosk heads, um, websites, trail mapping, brochures, and that type of thing. Um, so our um, proposed application will address um, education and interpretation projects. 
and um, that would consist of a, I mean, the total project cost is $20,000. Um, we're looking, it's a 50-50 match, so we would be looking to get $10,000 uh, from the Greenway, and our in-kind match would have to be $10,000. So the project focuses on three basic elements. One would be a new trail map and guide brochure, which would replace our obsolete walkabout brochure and our general Hyde Park Trail brochure. Um, the new map guide would um, include interpretive background on natural and cultural history along the trails, as well as our healthy and physical activity message that's uh, part of our walkabout program, which is where if you walk at least five of the trails each year, you earn a free patch. So um, this will, you know, the new, hopefully the new brochure would encourage, you know, greater engagement with the trails. Um, it would also advertise or just basically state our, we have like three annual events that we do each year. So that would be included in the brochure and um, access or links to our um, multi, oh God, multimedia podcasts that we have along some of the trails and videos. Um, the, new, the new map will also include some of the new trails um, that we have, such as the Hopeland area of Mills Norris State Park the Dominican Camp Overlook Trail and the River Ridge Trails. Um, and they would also um, um, upgrade some of the standard mapping tools that we have and enable to incorporate, incorporate those new maps into like web-based um, uh, uh, websites and access um, from websites to the, to the new maps. The second part of the project will focus on um, a website dedicated to the Hyde Park Trail, which um, would integrate the maps, um, visitors information, interpretive resources. And um, these are, you can find them now, but they're sort of scattered on different websites. Like it's part of the recreation page within the town website and the National Park Service mm -hmm. has um, part of it on theirs and scenic Hudson's. So, it's, it would just make it that much easier for people to find the website and get the information they want, like, right away. Um, and um, so that website, too, would, you know, be, they'd have links to our podcasts, um, um, interpretive videos that are being developed by the National Park Service on their parkland. And it would also just expand outreach and engagement um, through a calendar of trail-related programs and events, for instance, our walkabout program, our annual end-to-end -end hike, um, and it would include other activities and resources. Um, for instance, at the Winnikey, um Nature Site, there is an arboretum, which has a tour and a trail guide for uh, young families and students to, to uh, access. Um, and then the third um, component would be a trailhead kiosk at Mills Norris State Park. And it would be located at the Thompson Lane, where the new um, trail begins um, that heads south through uh, the new well, Scenic, Hudson's, Scenic Hudson's property, which is the old Dominican camp property. And right now, the new trail there um, leaves from Mills Norris State Park and goes down through the Dominican camp where there's a beautiful overlook with some benches and then continues south through um, River Ridge development. And that trail is what we're developing right now. So at that trailhead site on Thompson Lane um, at Mills Norris State Park, there would be a new kiosk with um, some detailed mapping for everyone. Um, so that's sort of it in a nutshell. Um, did you want any more information, or do you have any questions? Yeah, I'm a little uh, just curious about how the um, website will function in terms of uh, who, who will, you know, the projected costs for maintaining it and hosting it, and who will be doing the updating and that type of thing. Okay, let's see. I brought that with me. I did get a quote from um, a local... Um, graphic firm that develops websites. Um, we have it here on our... Um, oh, do you have it? Oh, okay, good. And it says free hosting for one year, but I think yes. the question is the, the hosting beyond that point, right? Okay, so I did... Um, I got 
some more information since then. Um, so the annual competitive cost for hosting a website is about $200 a year. And this particular uh, graphic firm had offered the first year free, which is pretty competitive. I think a lot of other graphic firms might do that. Um, they do also include two hours, like two separate sessions of training for an employee to learn how to basically you know, do some simple updates you know, to the website. And that's included in the initial cost of um, the website, creation of the website. Um, they also do you know, monthly contracts or quarterly contracts um, based on the size of your website, which could, you know, quarterly contract could, um, you know, the price could vary between $50 a quarter or 200 So let's say one month you need a new page or you want to put up some new photos, you know, they'd charge you, you know, a fee, maybe $50 or something like that. And then if the next month you don't use it, they would be willing to just roll that over to, you know, bill you the following month if you might need to make like, changes later on. So, the, you know, it can be pretty flexible as far as um, if you need them to do, um, you know, upgrades for you. Um, <clears throat> So an actual um, estimate to create the page, which could be between a 9 and 15 page website, is between 2,700 and 3,700. Um, depends on the complexity of the website. We don't foresee this being a really complex website. So we're looking more at the $2,700 price, which fits into our, um, you know, our grant application perfectly. Okay. Um, because the um, funds that we're requesting from the Greenway, the hard funds, would be the, um, <clears throat> the actual professional services for the creation of the website, um, the um, design and layout of the brochure, and, the, um, and the, map, the panels for the kiosk. So we would pr be providing um, a lot of, we would be pro providing all the photos and the text and that type of thing to the developer um, through in-kind services, through a lot, of, a lot of it will come from like the National Park Service personnel, um, where they have a professional photographer, would be getting the photographs from that person. Um, they have a resource planner who would um, also um, be able to provide a lot of information for the web and the kiosk content. Um, they have a curator and a visual information specialist. Again, this would be all in-kind um, um, and they're, services. They're willing to partner with us on it. That's great. Yes. Perfect. So um, it, it all sounds wonderful to me. I was just curious if you had maybe explored whether one of the other partners might be able to host the website, like the state or national parks might be able to host the website and use their staff who already know, you know, a lot more about yeah. the websites up to date. We're hoping so. maybe that that could happen. Um, so we're sort of taking it, I guess, one step at a time. Like mm -hmm. if we can get at least up and going yeah. and um, get that first year free, then we could definitely hopefully look to have our partners like that have bigger staffs like National Park <laughs> Service or even Scenic Hudson yeah. or Winnicky, um to be able to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's good because websites are more interesting when they're lively. So that's why yes. you want to keep it updated. Yeah. 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 So. so, and part of the web, you know, what the web um, service would be to, um, you know, how they how call it. It's listed and. Yes, yeah, strategic from, copy text, search, en search engine friendly. Mm -hmm. So they're always looking to, yeah. you know, keep it fresh so that if people are looking to, um, you know, um, hike on a trail that's not too long, they'd be able to, you know, punch something in there and come up with some of the trails yeah, right here in no, Hyde I think Park. that's great. Yeah. Good. Um, I don't really have any questions. Does anyone else from the board? No. Okay. That sounds good. That sounds great. So we actually okay. do have a resolution on tonight. Okay. Uh, great. So that you can go ahead and right. get the application submitted. I know you've done a lot of work, and yeah. thank you for that, Kathleen. Thanks thank you. Yeah. Let's do something the initiative. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and then I think there's a couple other things that we're going to get updated on. Right. Um, so the next thing is the um, Hackett House Accessible Entrance and Approach. And um, did you all get the information on that? Yes. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what was it that you got? I'm sorry. 
uh, the report um, from the Conic Resources? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, okay, great. And the quotes and the photos, we've got a, quite a packet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, so back in 2000, um, Taconic Resources for Independence came in and they actually um, did a survey of the Hackett House for us, um, or it's called an Architectural Barrier Consultation Survey, which, um, you know, recommends ways to make your facility um, accessible. So there were four different sections, one being the accessible approach and entrance at the house, um, the second, when you, once you get inside, goods and services, access to goods and services. The third priority would be access to bathrooms, and the fourth, um, any other measure that might be necessary. So um, we were especially interested, of course, in the first one, um, access to the, an approach to the entrance. And they did their study and they made some recommendations. Um, we have a circular driveway up there at Hackett. And on one side, there's actual uh, room for a parking space and um, a ramp that they pretty much spec'd out um, to um, provide access through the front door <laughs> at Hackett House. Um, so um, I had, he, he gave me the name of um, at least one company that does um, make ramps, and these are aluminum ramps, which you know wear pretty well, and um, pretty easily, pretty easy to install. Um, once they're designed, you know, then um, the company said that, you know, a, a grounds person, you know, like a staff person could easily put them, put it, assemble it. So, um, so I did get a quote and um, I got it updated um, just recently. Um, so that ramp would be about $4,050. Um, again, it's an aluminum sectional platform, um, 36 inch width. Um, you know, you're looking at a 1 to 20 ratio rise. It has double bars and handrails. Um, so, um, you know, we're sort of wanting to move forward on that. Um, there are a couple of the issues, though, like once you get into the house, um, the hallway, um, you, need a turn, you need to be able to turn around in the wheelchair. And so that would require us either to remove the radiator that's there in the hall or to widen the, um, you know, the, the door jam, the, the doorway that gets into the, the main room where you um, register for programs. Mm -hmm. So that's something that the Rec Commission said they want, you know, me to get some price information on before we go ahead. But I just yes. thought, you know, I'd bring it to your okay. board's attention, and it's something that we're considering. Okay. And could the Rec Trust funds be used for that? Um, oh, that's what we would we would hope to do. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And I thought we might be discussing the basketball court tonight, but I see that we're not. <laughs> well, Pete's not here, but do yeah. you want to? I mean, we can talk about it. I, Kathleen, I have one question. Sure. Um, the bathrooms are already handicapped accessible? <laughs> yes, they did um, put in a handicapped bathroom there probably about you know, 16 years ago, so that's, that is taken care of. And the only other accessible thing that would be required once you get into the uh, registration office would be just to lower the counter. Right now it's about this height, so you have to bring it down, which is, would be pretty easy to do. Cut so the it would, you'd have to remove the uh, radiator? Yes. And so we'd have to look about, look into how we would heat or if we would need to heat that front hallway. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's not an either or, you have to do the radiator plus the doorway? No, it'd be either or. Either oh, or. oh, either or. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Well, uh, I guess it depends on where the closest radiator is, if there's one in the main room. I mean, we could take a look at that, though. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. It's a beautiful old radiator, I though. I know, I'm you know. looking at the photo, it <laughs> really is beautiful. So it might be better just to make the, the um, To widen the, the walkway. doorway. Yeah. It might be better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we'll we'll discuss the, the basketball the court. Basketball yeah, court it looks like there's a lot going on tonight. Okay. So. All right. That's okay. fine. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Kathleen. You're welcome. Thanks, Kathleen. Okay.
Um, so the next item on our agenda, which is I have a feeling going to be very uh, uh, well spoken to, is the um, public comment on the proposed Anderson Group home at 55 Conley Drive. Um, we had a, a public information meeting last Thursday. I was on vacation, so uh, the deputy supervisor and councilman Ken Schneider hosted it, and Anderson came and met with many of you and answered uh, various questions. Um, we've asked our town attorney, this is obviously a very important issue uh, to all of you and to us as well. Um, we've asked our town attorney to uh, uh, take a look at the, the law because that's really what is dictating this. It's really not an initiative, it is definitely not an initiative of the town board, uh, but we are guided by the state law. So um, I'd like to just offer uh, Warren's uh, opinion. He's okay. spent some time studying the case law and various other aspects. So uh, perhaps you could just kind of review that for the public. Okay. And um, I just do also want to note that comments will be lim should be limited to three minutes. Please state your name and your address. And this is really a public comment session. It's not a dialogue. So uh, we have opportunities to um, get your questions, to answer them, to do the research, and then uh, we can let you know after. Okay, so Warren, do you want to go ahead? Sure. And um, the town received a notice uh, on or about July 13th from the Anderson Center for Autism of its intention to uh, develop a home as an individual residence alternative for five people with uh, developmental disabilities at 55 Connolly Drive in Hyde Park. Um, the notice uh, had indicated that it was including a um, um, the New York State Department of Social Services registry that includes a listing of other facilities that presently exist in the town of Hyde Park, uh, but that was not included with the notice. Um, and the town, uh, pursuant to Section 41.34C1 of the Mental Hygiene Law, had 40 days upon receipt of the notice to uh, respond to um, uh, the commissioner. Um, we've gotten that extended, um, uh, arguing that the 40-day time period should uh, run from the date that we receive the register, uh, registry information, um, and uh, it has been extended. The time period for the town to respond has uh, been extended to September 23, 2016. Um, pursuant to Mental Hygiene Law, Section 4134C1, uh, the town um, can do three things, one of three things, uh, when it receives this uh, type of notice. It can approve the site recommended by the sponsoring agency, um, or two, it can suggest one or more suitable sites within its jurisdiction that could accommodate the facility, or three, it could object to the establishment of a facility of the kind described by the sponsoring agency because to do so would result in a concentration of community residential facilities for the disabled in the municipality or in the area in proximity to the site selected or a combination of such facilities licensed by other agencies of the state government, including all community residents, intermediate care facilities for adults and residential treatment facilities for individuals with mental illnesses or developmental disabilities operated pursuant to Article 16 or Article 13 of that chapter of the law, and all similar facilities, residential facilities of 14 or less residents operate or are licensed by another state facility, such, I've added the word such, but that's not in there, that the nature and character of the areas within the municipality would be substantially um, altered. Um, so, um, We've resolved the issue of the notice. I had uh, given some legal advice to the town. Um, but um, just to give you a, an overview of what this um, statute is all about, uh, prior to the enactment of Section 4134 of the Mental Hygiene Law, there was no New York State uh, statute dealing directly with the issues of local municipalities' oversight over the selection of community residences. Um, this resulted in a fair amount of litigation mm -hmm. and acrimony um, and uh, polarization of uh, communities 
Um, and in some cases, the uh, courts held that the state had preempted the field and that group homes could be established in disregard of local laws and ordinances despite the lack of an overriding state statute. Uh, this was this conflict in uh, in the law was resolved by uh, the state legislature when it enacted Chapter 468 of the Laws of 1978, which established Mental Hygiene Law Section 4134. Uh, and the design of the law, and I'm taking this out of the legislative history of the law, was first to provide local input in the site selection process for local governments to maintain the nature and character of the community, and second, to discourage frivolous legal challenges and encourage a process of joint discussion and accommodation between the providers of care and services to the mentally disabled and representatives of the community rather than legal uh, antagonism. I'm taking that from the governor's memorandum when they uh, passed that law. Um, and the intent of the legislation was to limit the power of local legislation in the area of the siting of these facilities uh, but at the same time not precluding all <coughs> local uh, involvement in the community residential siting process. Um, and and the, the gist of this law is section 4134F, which provides that a community residence established pursuant to this section and family care home shall be uh, deemed a family unit for purposes of local law and ordinances. So basically what the state has done um, it's, uh, these community res residences are now required to be treated um, as single family residences under the municipality's local zoning law, which severely limits the uh, ability of towns, uh, municipalities to regulate these facilities through their local zoning. What the state has basically done is what we call preempted the, uh, the power of towns cities and villages um, to control the siting of these facilities through their local zoning ordinances. Um, it doesn't preempt all the power of the municipality. <coughs> the municipality still has the power to require these facilities to apply, uh, uh, comply with the same uh, requirements um, as are required of all single family residences. Uh, so they have to get a building permit. If they are building, they have to comply with all the requirements that a single-family residence would have to comply with uh, in establishing a single-family residence. But that's basically the limit of what municipalities can do uh, to regulate these facilities. And attempts by municipalities to do more than that uh, by regulating uh, these facilities under their zoning law um, have, have been struck down by the courts. Um, and um, as a result of this statute, uh, once a community residence facility is approved uh, for a proposed site by the commissioner or the state agency or department responsible for such licensing, uh, the municipality's oversight of the siting of these facilities is limited to what's put in section 4134, which I read to you before approve the uh, recommended uh, recommended site um, to suggest more one or more suitable sites within the jurisdiction to accommodate the facility or C2 object to the establishment of the site on the grounds that it would create such a concentration or speci uh, speci uh, of, of re residential care facilities that the nature and character of the area would be substantially altered. And that's a two-fold test. Um, uh, it, it, one, there has to be the concentration, but the concentration has to um, uh, substantially impact the character of the area. It's a very difficult burden for a municipality to meet in, in overcoming uh, these, uh, this statute. Um, the municipality is permitted but not required to hold a public hearing to the community. Um, and if an alternative site is suggested by the municipality, and it's usually done through the input of the community providing uh, information on alternative sites um, and our own um, um, due diligence in looking at these sites and seeing if we can identify other more suitable sites. Um, the um, uh, the uh, sponsoring agency can select 
that alternative site and seek to establish the site in that location. Um, but if the uh, site is not satisfactory to the sponsoring agency, um, the agency will notify or must notify the municipality, which then has 15 days to suggest another alternative site. Um, in the event that the municipality does object to the establishment of the facility uh, on the grounds that we've, uh, I've already stated, uh, or if the municipality and the sponsoring agency cannot agree on an alternative site, um, either side, the municipality or the sponsoring agency, has the right to uh, an immediate hearing before the commissioner. Um, and the commissioner now has to conduct a hearing within 15 days of such request. Um, the, the burden placed on a municipality um, at these hearings is, to say the least, a heavy burden. Um, the need for such facilities in a municipality um, um, shall be considered uh, as the overriding, uh, as the first factor. Once the, the need for the facility is established by the sponsoring agency, um, the, uh, the municipality has to come forward with proof um, and it has to be um, proof in the form of sub substantial evidence, clear and convincing evidence, uh, that the establishment of the community residential facility um, in that site would result in an over-concentration of the same so as to substantially alter the nature and character of the area. Um, and such challenges will only be sustained where the evidence in opposition is concrete and of a convincing nature, mere conclusory al allegations absent testimony um, uh, indicating or proving the detrimental effect are, have been held uh, not to be uh, sufficient. And um, in my research, um, I found that um, um, in a large majority of the cases, if not all of them, um, the commissioner has sustained the citing that's requested. Um, and I have not yet been able to find a court case um, which overturned a commissioner's decision through an Article 78 petition. Doesn't mean that it doesn't exist because I only have privy to uh, recorded cases. There could be cases in which they have been overturned, but uh, I read a law review article from 1999 and up to that point there hadn't been a single case that was um, uh, that was uh, uh, overturned by, by the courts. Um, so um, if, if Anderson can demonstrate the need for the home uh, and that the proposed site is sufficiently os isolated from other similar facilities so as to avoid an undue concentration in the relevant geographical areas um, in the absence of competent proof that the facility would result in a concentration of the same uh, or similar facilities, uh, such as the nature and character of the area will be altered, the decision of the commissioner uh, would, be, um, uh, would be upheld. This is not to discourage the public from commenting and providing us with the input. Uh, the town will certainly, uh, with my guidance, be reviewing everything and, if appropriate, will make the necessary um, um, proposal to Anderson either for an alternative site or make the uh, argument to the commissioner that the site uh, is inappropriate under the standards of the law. So I'm just giving you what the, what the law has, uh, is and how the courts have reviewed the law. And um, um, there is no decision, obviously, that's been made by the town board. I mean, it's, it's open to receipt of, of of the public comment that's already been received and the comment we received tonight. I just want you to know uh, the difficulty that we have given the limitations in our powers under this law. Thank you, Warren. Thank you very much. Uh, again, we are here to listen. Um, this was not our initiative. We understand your concerns. We share them. So this is an opportunity for you to express them. Uh, again, please contain your uh, comments to three minutes. I did receive a few uh, comments by email, which I forwarded to the town clerk for the record. So uh, I also just reiterate, there's nothing on the agenda tonight to have any vote or any yeah. resolution on this issue. So this is really just for <coughs> comment, and um, any resolution would be in September. That's right. 
Okay, so come on up. I'm Barbara Streitman from 35 Connolly Drive, and I want to make a simple statement. We're concerned about the increase in traffic, especially from the shift workers, um, which will change the character of the neighborhood. This has been a neighborhood in which we, the residents, including senior citizens like myself and families with babies, have been able to walk, run, bicycle, and take the babies out in strollers safely in the street. The street, the closed loop, is what we have. We don't have sidewalks, and um, there's no alternate loud route. It's a closed loop. Um, also, right at the entrance to the loop, there is another, almost at the entrance, there's another um, facility similar to what is being proposed. Thank you for your consideration, Supervisor and Board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Supervisor Rohr and members of the board. I'm Ray Harrington. I live at 3 Connolly Drive. I had sent you a, um, a detailed note earlier in the day uh, detailing at length our um, concerns about the placement of this particular group home, uh, specifically addressing the, um, the uh, concentration issue, um, addressing the unique safety issues that the placement of this home would uh, result in, <coughs> and specifically addressing the, uh, the unique character of our, of our road. Um, you've just heard one of our, you know, uh, neighbors speak about the unique character. I could I could talk for an hour about what a beautiful uh, cul-de-sac it is. If, if you haven't been there, I invite you to go up and take a drive around the loop. Um, uh, the con the uh, degree at which it's used for you know, walking and jogging and biking, not just by us, but by you know nearby community, is uh, is impressive to see. All hours of the day, people are out walking and jogging. As you walk around the loop, you'll see deer and hawks and turkeys and birds of all kinds. There's an enormous variety of trees on the road. You think you're driving through a state park. Uh, it really is a beautiful setting. Um, and right now, as mentioned, there is uh, pretty much just residential traffic with some delivery traffic and, of course, school buses, which are somewhat restricted now as well because the neighborhood has aged some since, since we've all moved in. Um, and so one concern, well, so, so that, that's the character of the road, and, it, and it's pretty much insured to us by, by both current zoning. The zoning can change over time. It's changed significantly since I've been in the house, but also uh, deed restrictions, which uh, greatly uh, restrict what people can do with the properties, even to the extent of excluding connector roads from coming through any property or being sold for that use to any other adjacent properties or other roads. Okay, now, um, so with regard to the safety issue, um, as you're probably aware, or may, maybe maybe are aware, or maybe not, um, cul-de-sacs are now were very popular years back, but they're now greatly discouraged. Not just in Dutchess County, but throughout the country, actually. Um, in Dutchess County, um, current code basically says that cul-de-sacs should be discouraged, and when they are placed, should be limited to length of 800 feet, and a maximum of 10 homes accessing them. That that road and should be less than or equal to about 100 vehicle trips per day. So our road already um, is grossly unsafe by those standards. We are uh, about three quarters of a mile to the back. There's no parallel roads where there's any chance of bringing in other, other uh, safety you know, vehicles to gain access or anything. Um, we have a density of about 47 homes, so we're about five times the kind of density that's now approved for these sorts of uh, developments. Um, and our vehicle traffic, I can assure you, is over 100 per, per day. Uh, so uh, one of our concerns is the increased traffic, as already mentioned. Um, based on the description, it was tough to get a clear description of the number of people that would come in, but based on the description, it sounds like this would generate an increase of as many, the equivalent of maybe four new homes worth of traffic between staff coming and goings and people coming in and out. And we don't expect that, you know, that they're going to exercise the same degree of caution that we've all come to exercise for ourselves and our neighbors driving in the road, okay? Now, with regard to the intersection. Um, so Connolly Drive uh, butts against or exits out onto 9G. 
Okay, exactly opposite. There's a cross intersection there. By the way, the current Dutchess County Code do, um, uh, does not permit those or states explicitly they shall be um, avoided except in the case of major road intersections. So cross intersections like that aren't even uh, permitted in general anymore. Um, this particular one, 9G, it's a 55 mile an hour zone there. There are warning signs about the intersection, but people tend to ignore them, as you can imagine, especially during rush hours. It's exactly opposite County Route 37, North Cross Road, which is the only connector road in the, north of the, the town center. Right, so that, that road gets a ton of traffic as well in the morning. It's a treacherous intersection. I've been doing it for 26 years. I just taught my daughter to drive. I spent most of the time teaching her about that intersection, what to look out for. In the mornings, people do all kinds of crazy things. I mean, it's just horrendous. There's no, there's no, path, there's no turn lanes. There's no uh, sight visibility is horrible. It is really treacherous. Accidents happen there regularly. I got to believe, I knew years ago it was the most dangerous in the town. They've done one thing to improve it. Um, I got to believe it's still one of the most dangerous in the, in the town. People that live near the highway there routinely hear crashes at night. And when these happen, uh, because of the severe nature of m many of these accidents, access, safety access to the road, uh, ingress, egress is cut off. We've also had ingress, egress cut off during natural events like Hurricane Katrina, for instance. Um, and there is no way of getting safety vehicles in during those times when that happens. Further aggravating the situation, just 300 feet south of the intersection is the Greystone, um, is the Greystone Statsburg group home, right? Um, which also generates more traffic. Um, buses stop to pick people up in the morning. That traffic backs up all the way into the intersection at times. Trust me, when people get backed up and panicky in the morning, the aggressive behavior comes out at that intersection. Um, it's, it's just a very unsafe situation. Um, finally, I'll just speak to the concentration in that region. Um, my understanding is this would be the 10th group home in the town, three of which would now be located, two of them now directly impacting that one intersection, which is already, I gotta believe, the most dangerous in the town. Um, and a third one down in Falk Hill puts three of them, 30% of the, all the group homes in the whole town within a little small, you know, about a three quarter of a mile square area. So 2% of the town area would now have 30% of the group homes, okay? I think that covers the bulk of what I wanted to say. There's, it's all in detail in the, in the uh, what I sent earlier. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are we going to get a, a copy of that map? Yeah, that. Uh, I think we have. Oh, we have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we made it. Yeah. <laughs> map we made. Oh, with that map, showing the concentration. Oh, with the map. With the map. Hi, I'm Doris Harrington. I live at 3 Connolly Drive, which means I am on the corner. I am diagonally opposite the Greystone Statsburg House. And just so you know, some of their residents use our road also for recreation. And they seem to enjoy it quite a bit when they get out walking. I wanted to address the letter that was sent to you by Anderson. Um, we all have wants and needs when we purchase a home for our family. And that's basically what they're doing. They're looking for a home for a family group. But as we all know, wants can't always take precedence over needs. Um, the lovely letter says the house is spacious, that's a want, and possibly a need. Provides privacy, that's a want. There are many group homes that are not shielded from roads. They are right, in fact, Greystone has one right up on Route 9. That map only shows the homes that are actually in Hyde Park. It does not show Clinton. It does not show Soul Point, and it does not show Rhinebeck just up the road. So if you expanded the radius to the other towns, you would have double the number of homes within about an eight mile radius to where they wish to put home. But I would like to continue on the letter. They, they enclosed, okay, first off, they said it allows easy access for county services. Let me backtrack. As you see in the letter that was sent to you and what my husband just described, County services such as ambulance, fire, and police are sometimes cut off from access of the road. I can't tell you how many days I sent my child over the side of my property out to a bus because the road was closed. What happens then? That's not easy access for the gentleman in that home. I actually told Anderson, if I was a parent and I have been a parent of a child in a group home, I would not put my child in a group home that did not have safety access. If I go to the residential sheet that they have sent to you, which appears to be detailed, letters A, 
adequate size of lot. What is that? That's very nebulous. Is that stated in state law? A through, K, through L, I only find letter K that actually addresses state law. It says that it shall comply with certain codes within the state. If I look at B through J, enough bedrooms to avoid the dormitory effect, is that in state law? Because my daughter was in as an adolescent in a group home and as an adult, and in both cases, she shared a room. She had a lovely lady roommate. So is that a want or a need? I, I would like to get to the heart of the matter. This is on Greystone letterhead. Is this a listing of the state requirements, or is this a listing of what Anderson would like to have in a home? And I think that's important to ascertain. And I think as a community, we do need to know which it is. After they have purchased a home on a four acre lot, that's the home currently does not meet the requirements. I believe they have to install sprinklers. That's part of the state law. That's not even on their list of desires. They want five bedrooms. This is a four bedroom home. They want two bedrooms on the first floor. All the bedrooms in this home are on the second floor. So we are not talking about they found their dream home for the family. Where They found a home that is close to their base of operations at Anderson School, as are many of their other homes. They found a home that has a lot of privacy. Those two things are not in the state requirements. The other thing is, once they own the home, IRAs, you can put up to 14 residents. They are currently planning to house five, which would bring the staff for five. If they decide, this is a soft real estate market and somehow they can't find a house anywhere else, what happens when the real estate market tightens up in six or eight years and they have a need to house more residents and they decide to expand homes? Now, instead of staff, for five residents, we could double or treble that staff because maybe now they're going to expand to 14 residents. Remember, Greystone is placing their graduates. They are constantly graduating young men and women and placing them in community residence. What guarantee do we have then? Because now, if five residents is the equivalent maybe of adding you know, four single family homes as far as traffic, what happens then when we double and treble that number? And you know that, that's what I would like to know. This, this fact sheet that they sent you is on their letterhead and only references in one spot the state law. I would like a more detailed accounting from them of what are the state regs of what they need as opposed to their wish list of what they might want. And it's the same thing we all we all do when we look for a home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to read mine. <laughs> <laughs> Beth Ackerman at 21 Connolly Drive. I oppose the Anderman Anderson Center purchase, as do the great majority of those who live on our street. We have a petition we'd like to present to the board containing currently 71 signatures, <coughs> with some more to come by those who have not been in town since we first heard about the Anderson Purchase less than two weeks ago. One of my big concerns is the major increase in traffic this purchase would mean for Connolly Drive. We heard that there will be three, three shift changes, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Two of those shift changes overlap closely with times when children are standing by the road and getting on and off school buses. The extra traffic due to Anderson employees coming and going during these shift changes endangers children in our neighborhood. There will be an 11 p.m. shift change. Our street has nearly no traffic that late at night, but that change adding to the noise and headlights that are currently non-existent at that time of night. Furthermore, nearly everyone who currently drives into or out of our neighborhood is a resident, a friend, or family, and thus, has an interest in driving safely on our street. Anderson employees, on the other hand, would simply be driving to work with no personal connection to our neighborhood. It's simply where their job is. Further, due to the relatively low pay that our group home workers currently receive, we believe there will be significant, significant tra 
staff turnover and thus an even higher likelihood of problems due to careless or fast driving on Connolly Drive. The proposed location at 55 Connolly Drive is, as you can see on the map, at the very furthest point of our street from 9G entrance. Therefore, nearly everyone on our street will be affected by the added traffic that, our group home, that the group home purchase will bring. Many neighbors walk their dogs, run, walk themselves, and ride bikes. Additional cars on the road is a danger to all our neighbors. In order to slow down traffic and add to the beauty of the street, Connolly Drive was laid out with many curves, many of which are blind curves for those who are driving. Those who live here have a connection and reason and experience to make sure they navigate these curves safely. Group home employees who will likely be changing often will not have the connection or experience that residents do dealing with these curves. Finally, we have two steep hills on the street that are tricky to drive up during snow and ice events. And at 55 Connolly Drive, you have to drive up one of those two hills. And I'm sure are driven more carefully by permanent residents than employees will. For the many reasons listed above and others that I have stated, I strongly oppose this purchase. Thank you. Thank you. And I have the petition and a copy of this. Sure. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. I don't think it was mentioned earlier. I just wanted to point out that Councilman Schneider is um, away on business today, um, a long planned th um, business responsibility that he uh, uh, regrets that he couldn't be here. But he'll certainly be watching this meeting, um, th the video of this meeting later. So I just wanted you all to be aware that your councilman um, cares and will be keeping up on this. Thanks, Emily. Hi. Hello. Am I good here? <laughs> Hi. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak today. I'm Ann Palavita, 39 Connolly Drive. I am not in favor of the proposal to establish a community residence at, residence at 55 Connolly. I appreciate the excellent work done by the Anderson Community for Auti Center for Autism, and I think everybody here does. My concerns are focused on the high level of saturation of community residences in Connolly Drive area and in Northern Hyde Park and Statsburg. I believe that these residences should be more spread out within Hyde Park to better serve all parties. The addition of another community residence within a mile of the current Greystone residence would cause a significant increase in traffic at the already dangerous 9G North Cross Road Connolly Drive intersection for all the reasons that have already been stated, but that really is a treacherous place. It's currently a concern for all of us who live on Connolly Drive due to accidents and congestion. The addition of a dozen or more vehicles within a 24-hour period every day would seriously add to those traffic concerns. Based on these issues, I think that a better Hyde Park location can be found for the Anderson community residents. Thank you. And I have a copy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Steve Ackerman, uh, 21 Connolly Drive. Uh, I'd like to first thank the town board for uh, notifying us of the uh, proposed Anderson purchase, uh, for organizing last Thursday night's meeting, um, for giving us this evening to publicly comment, and for working to extend the deadline to September 23rd. Uh, I also oppose the Anderson purchase. I believe I, I speak for others on our street, probably everyone on our street, in saying that you know, we have no issue with those who are, are disabled. Society certainly has an obligation to care for those who, who can't care for themselves. And I'm sure Anderson does a terrific job in, in working with those with autism. But the location of the proposed residence on Connolly Drive simply does not make sense compared to alternative locations, and we think there are many of them in, in Hyde Park. Uh, people already mentioned about um, how much our street is used uh, for walking and, and enjoying the, the neighborhood. Uh, we often see those, it's not just us, we often see those from outside our, of our neighborhood walking on the street, including the residents of the Greystone uh, group home. Um, we've talked about the 
number of shifts and so on, and the huge amount, I think, of traffic that will be added to our street. Um, so while not an exact analogy, approving this group home location will be something like opening up a popular hiking trail in town to vehicular traffic. That's what it's going to feel like uh, to us. Um, a couple of observations regarding Anderson's presentation and, and their, um, their requirements. They, they currently plan to add two ground floor bedrooms at 55 Connolly, but that doesn't even meet their own stated requirements. On the community fact sheet that they included uh, in the letter to the town, they said they needed several bedrooms on the ground floor. They're only adding two. Uh, they want an adequate size of common spaces, living and dining. And they also said they need three or more single bedrooms on the main floor. They're only adding two. On the main floor, there's currently a kitchen, a living room, a dining room, and a family room. So if three of those rooms are turned into bedrooms, which is what they stated they need, I don't see how that leaves any uh, common space. So I'm not sure why Anderson thinks this is an ideal location, which they said last Thursday, when it doesn't even meet their own uh, stated requirements. <coughs> They also uh, indicated last Thursday they, they don't want to build on any of the many available lots in, in Hyde Park. It sounded almost as if this is state policy. However, I know of one residence at 20 Morehouse Road in Poughkeepsie, which was built brand new, a stick built from the ground up in the early 2000s by New Horizons Resources and currently operates as a group home. It was built as a group home and currently still operates that way. I'm sure there are other group homes in the area and statewide which were newly built and therefore able to exactly meet the needs of the residents. And finally, I wanted to, to give one um, example I came across, I suspect there may be others, uh, that's uh, kind of an alternative to the, the legal routes that, that uh, Mr. Oplansky noted. In Scarsdale, uh, there was a lot of opposition to a proposed group home uh, fairly recently. Uh, there was a uh, there were town hearings, um, and to make a long story short, the town board or the or the village board uh, objected uh, and recommended to the sponsoring agency that they withdraw. And due to the amount of opposition, the sponsoring agency did withdraw their proposed siting. So I'd ask that the the town board town board keep that in mind. This doesn't necessarily have to go through the whole legal process hearings and going to the state commissioner for, um, you know, as just as another alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Good evening, I'm Paul Cantor from 33 Connolly Drive. And uh, I won't, I was going to tell you all about Connolly Drive, but it's been, it, it is a truly special place and uh, it is used by many. And I can tell you, uh, we've lived here for 12 years. The, the only reason we are living in Hyde Park is Connolly Drive. If it weren't for Connolly Drive, there's no way we'd be living in Hyde Park. That's how much we thought it was special. It's so much so that even that we, uh, we, we settled on a house that we weren't that thrilled with just to get on Connolly Drive. So when this came about, you can imagine to, 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 the, to us in the 14 years here, this is a major uh, life changing event for us because we're now taking the character of, of the very reason we're here. And uh, this past Thursday, I went to the Anderson meeting and I listened carefully to what they had to say, and uh, they obviously put their best foot forward in explaining what they would do, what they wouldn't do, how traffic patterns wouldn't change, how they only had a small ratio of, of, of uh, staff to people, and that they buy their own food and they come in with the, within the same vehicle so you won't have any trucks, and there's only one van, and it sounded pretty good. I mean, I, I, I was frankly surprised. So I, on a whim, I drove up to the Enderkill property, which is where these folks are coming from. And it was just, it, I don't know if you know the site, but it's a long driveway up. And I sat at the bottom for a minute and said, Geez, should I really go up or shouldn't I? And then I said, well, hell, they're coming into my neighborhood. Maybe I'll just drop up and see what I see. 
I went up and I was stunned. There were eight to ten vehicles parked there. I don't think I saw them all. And that is totally, totally not in context with what we were told at that meeting. I mean, it's an order of magnitude. So some of the folks here were telling you uh, about the, any number you heard here about per day. Uh, there, there were more. There were more cars up there at th that moment. Now they might have been having a. Uh, God knows what, but there were no people around, uh, and the, the, then somebody came out and I just left because I didn't want to oppose, but uh, that shocked me. Uh, on, a, on a personal note, though, I'd like to point out something to the board because I think, it, I've lived here for 14 years, and it's clear that Hyde Park is a struggling town, residentially. I mean, there's loads of housing that is dilapidated, substandard problems, and I and and I, and I know all of us in the neighborhood, all of you on the board, have been doing your your best to improve this situation. And I just have one suggestion. What they're putting out is they're 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 taking a relatively expensive home for Hyde Park, and then they're going to make a very expensive uh, renovation to it. And as you heard, it's, it clearly will not be the last renovation because it practically, it makes no sense, it makes no common sense. And uh, if they do that, they're going to be doing something else a year or two or three later, and, or else the thing is not going to work for them. Now, why don't we try and think out of the box a little bit? And why couldn't we find a far cheaper property in town someplace? and something that does need renovations, something that's drawing the, the value of property in the neighborhood down, something the neighborhoods are complaining to you folks about because they don't have property values. Why can't we make this, take that investment package, put it together and make something that everybody can be proud of? And the neighbors around that will be thrilled because their property values will go up. And the most insulting thing that I heard at that meeting was uh, one of them said that they, they know of a case where property values went up when a home like this went in to help assuage. But in, this, in, my, in my alternative, I really do believe there's a win-win for this if we just try and think outside of the box. We have more than enough alternatives here where, where we could fix something up that would work for them and, and the neighbors would be thrilled to get the improved property, which could then hopefully raise another part of the town and, and bring it up to par uh, to what we enjoy up in, uh, in, in on Connolly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this actually worked out to be good timing because we're appointing you tonight oh, you <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> to the, to the oh, audit so committee. <laughs> yeah. Do you like Okay. Um. Um, my name is my name is Terry Bertles, and I'm at 22 Conley Drive, and we've lived there. Oh gosh, I think it's been 12 years or so, and we absolutely love it. I walk the dog three, four times a day. Uh, enough where the neighbors are teasing me because I'm on the street. I'm a street walker. Um, and I do agree with everything my neighbors have said, uh, predominantly about the increase of traffic. Uh, quite often, because um, I am on the street, uh, people who are coming in to do work come quickly. And it's a very curvy road. Uh, it's not, you know, I have the dog. I'm like, come on, come on, get off the road. Because people do take those blind curves very quickly. Um, but one thing that has not been touched on tonight that I think the town really needs to take into consideration in regards to the clustering, these are all in the same fire district, predominantly. That's a huge burden. Not only is this, are these clusters in the same fire district or first responders, Anderson School itself is in the same fire district. And that alone, I think, is a strong argument for safety, not only for us, in the town or in that district, but for Anderson itself. Um, one access road in, one way in, one way out. So for that reason as well, I think it should be considered to find another site. Um, and I'd ask a question of 
how would we present those sites to you if we had some suggestions? Email them. Email them. Yep. Okay, and then also I wanted to know, um, Let's. I'm just going to make up a scenario. This won't happen, well, obviously. Can I just interrupt you? Actually, th this is not a dialogue session. Oh, okay. So it's, I, okay, you know, I didn't want to okay. make it clear people can email me. With and then you'll respond to the questions. Yeah. Okay. okay. But again, I just okay. want to reiterate the safety issue for the first responders. But why don't you reformulate your question into a statement? <laughs> okay. Well, I would hope that if we are able to present a home to you in a timely manner, um, being as, say, this week, um, that you could respond within, you know, five to six days because we're really under the limit of how much time we have for you to respond to Anderson School. Um, I mean, you do have other options to approve or deny, uh, including the clustering due for safety, I think. Um, and if there are homes or if anybody has connections um, where they know other realtors, that they could come up with a safer site. I hope that they, you would, you know, use those maybe homes that are, are coming on the market. Um, that would be helpful too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Steve Brady, 68 Connolly Drive. For the sake of time and everyone else that wants to speak, uh, I strongly oppose uh, Anderson buying 55 Connolly uh, for all the reasons that you've heard so far and the more reasons you'll hear shortly. So I'm saving everybody the anguish. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Good evening. Hi. Linda Marquis, 13 Connolly Drive. I already forwarded my email to you, so I just want to let my neighbors know that my approach to this is just a little bit different. Um, as they said, 55 Connolly Drive is a gorgeous home. It is a home that they are going to have to totally retrofit in order to be useful to these gentlemen. They're going to have to put in a bigger parking lot. They're going to have to expand the septic system. They're going to have to build rooms downstairs for the visually impaired, two visually impaired gentlemen. It's an executive home, and I think you all know what that means. When all the McMansions were going up in our area, everybody wanted one of these homes. Sunken tub, granite countertops, hardwood floors, a foyer that you would kill for. It's something that Hollywood would do movies in. They're going to take this home off the tax rolls. This is a viable home that eventually would sell. Don't know what the buyer, what the seller of the home is trying, if, if he has to get out from under it. Not really sure because we couldn't get those answers last week. Last week they would not tell us how much the house was going for, but if you look at Zillow, it's listed at $385,000. It started at four hundred and twenty-five. dollars They spoke to us about community, which is very important to all of us. You've heard my neighbors. They all feel the same way. We are a community. Don't want to be separate from anybody else. We like to be inclusive. But one of the con things that concerns me is that when I went back and I looked at the homes that they have on the map, have you looked at these properties? Now, they want those gentlemen to be part of a community, but yet they're buying a home with four acres of land where the house is set way back from the street. Unless you're invited, you're not just dropping by. There's only one home on, the on this list at Hillman Drive, 7 Hillman Drive, that is built on less than one acre of land. If you look at the rest of these properties, Schultz Hill, 6.14 acres, North Quaker Lane, 8 acres, Route 9G, 3.6, Fall Kill, 5.1. You look at the price of these homes that Zillow estimates, 420, 519, 400, 305, and the cream of the crop, East Meadowbrook, me, excuse me, Meadowbrook, 7.35 acres, $577,000. Now, one of my neighbors said, talked about need per versus want. These houses, and I know as a taxpayer, you all understand this because I'm sure you hear it all the time, our taxes keep going up and up and up. Somewhere along the line, you take need and you get rid of want. Because a home that's worth $400,000, I tried to find what the taxes were, but they weren't listed. But I know what my taxes are on my little house. That house there has to be paying anywhere from thirteen dollars to 15000 considering the acreage and the size of that house. So let's just take the 10 houses that we have that are now off the tax rolls because they are group homes. 
it's over $100,000, 150000 in taxes. Maybe we should look at Anderson and say, yes, there are other homes, zombie homes that have been sitting for a very, very long time, that if you want to renovate to make that house for them, that's perfectly fine. But why take an executive home that would bring tax money into this town as opposed to a $12,000 or $14,000 in taxes, take a zombie home off the, pro off the rolls. That won't be a problem. Fix those houses up. And I think that if you look at it from a fiscally responsible stance, it makes a heck of a lot more sense to be able to look at them as a town board and say, hey, look, money's tight, 2% tax cap. We can't keep up with our infrastructure. We can't keep up with the businesses that are leaving, the people that are leaving, Somewhere along the line, fiscally responsibility might be the point that might make them understand it's time to look at a different home. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to speak? Okay. Um, well, I appreciate everyone coming out. We're going to uh, be digesting these comments. We have until September 23rd to react to the uh, Anderson proposal, and uh, I'm sure we'll be giving... I'm sorry? Oh. Um, and <laughs> we'll be giving uh, an update, I'm sure, on our September 12th meeting. So. Um, you know, I do appreciate you all coming out, appreciate what you're saying. Um, yeah, sure. So I just have a, a protocol question. Actually, two protocol questions. You said there will be comment at the September 12th meeting. Wouldn't the vote be at that meeting? I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure yet what we'll be doing. Um, I said that we will surely be giving an update by then. So I don't, at this point, I'm not committing to any particular action at that meeting. Okay, when would we know when there would be an action, just so we don't run out of well, time? Well, you know what, uh, you can, I'm sorry? The website? Is there you can check the website, um, or well, we, we did can... take a list of everyone's email addresses oh. on Thursday night, and I think that um, Ken would probably be happy to send out and you know an update, an update. as that meeting approaches. Does that make sense? Yeah, and we can also post yeah. it on the website. Okay, that would be yeah. great. Yeah. And my second was if there were people <coughs> who, just in the interest of time, aren't going to comment now, but they have a written comment, can we bring them up? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Sure. Or send, or send, them, send them in, or yeah. email them. Either way. Sure, no problem. Yep, so you can email me directly. That would be a r o h r at hydeparkny.us. Warren, did you have any? Yeah, I just had, uh, there was a question about the time period. So the time <laughs> period uh, that we have to respond is September 23rd. Uh, there was some mention about um, the homeowners coming forward with some alternative sites. Uh, I would urge you to get that information to the town board as soon as possible so that we can look at those. Um, so the sooner you get those into us, it doesn't have to be a list, it can be as you get them, and get us a, as much information as you can. You can, um, you can get the uh, parcel access for any, any sites, any address from Dutchess County. You can refer that to us or send it to us or we'll get it. But uh, we do, we're under a bit of a time crunch in terms of responding. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, we actually still have a, an additional public comment. If anyone would like to comment on the... I'm sorry. Um, could I just interrupt you for a minute? Yeah, the list? I don't have it with me tonight. Uh, should Which we put out a... Right? Yeah, Here, wait could a second. someone just turn a paper over on that back table and make a sheet for email addresses for anyone that didn't, um, didn't already leave theirs? Thank you. Oh, yeah, I have them. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's okay. No, it wasn't your fault. <coughs> okay. Is there...
here today. Okay, so um, we'll just be moving on through our agenda as I started. Not yet, but I'm about to. Stay here. Stay here. Steve, don't go anywhere. <laughs> That's next. <laughs> That's next. Okay. Um, so um, I'd like to open up pub public comment on any of the resolutions or any item of town business at this point in time. Would you like? Good evening. Uh, could someone just close the doors, maybe? Yeah, because we do have... Yeah, we do have yeah. more of the meeting. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, Steve. It's all right. <laughs> um. Ready? Yes, yeah. we're ready. Yeah. Thank you. Steve Hughes, town resident, and I'm also the town webmaster. I just wanted to let you know that our account on the host for the town website has plenty of capacity so if you wanted to put the recreation trail uh website there um we'd be able to accommodate it i would probably just need to talk to whoever was doing the design to see what their requirements were and and what was involved in updating it so if you so could just pass would that, that be a separate website that could be hosted on the same um, we could meeting? give it a separate um, separate address. Separate address. Okay. We could give it an address that ended in Hyde Park NY US. So okay. Hyde Park Trails dot Hyde Park NY US or whatever Kathleen wanted. So Great. if you could pass that on to her, I will. Thank okay. You, okay. Thank, thanks. thanks so much, Steve. Thanks. Steve. Uh, does anyone else have any public comment? Okay, uh, then we'll move on to the resolution portion of our meeting. Um, Emily, would you like to start? Sure, resolution 822-1 of 2016, resolution appointing members to the Town of Hyde Park Audit Committee and amending resolution 524 of 2013, defining the purpose and standards for the Town of Hyde Park Audit Committee. Second. And um, all in favor? Aye. 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 And so this was a recommendation of our town comptroller that uh, we form an audit committee that will assure that the town always receives independent audits. And uh, fortunately mm -hmm. tonight we have um, one of our- Two of uh, our, two. Uh, Two. Right, Brendan is here also. Oh, wait, yeah. oh sorry, hey, Brendan. <laughs> I don't have my classes. Two of our volunteers, uh, we have Paul Cantor and Brendan Lawler. And uh, thank you very much for stepping up to the plate and I look forward to working with you. Hopefully it won't be overly time consuming, but an hour or two every quarter. And it's nice to get to work with new people. And both of you have reached out um, independently and it's nice to bring you uh, on board. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Very yeah. nice. Uh, resolution 822-2 of 2016, resolution reappointing Robert Linville to the Town of High Park Board of Ethics. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 822-3 of 2016, resolution authorizing the Hyde Park Planning Board to return the balance of escrow as stated in their approved resolution number 16F, passed on July 21st, 2016. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 822-4 of 2016, resolution authorizing the Hyde Park Zoning Board to return the balance of escrow to Speedway. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 822-5 of 2016, a resolution authorizing the issuance of $755,000 in bonds for the town of Hyde Park, Dutchess County, New York, to pay the cost of the construction of sidewalks along Route 9 in and for said town. I just, could I explain yes, that for yes, a minute before I do. second it? Um, so this this is in regards to the, the TAP grant that we received to construct sidewalks along Route 9, uh, approximately from Park Plaza down to the Quality Inn. And um, this is being reimbursed 80% through a grant. 
So um, this is not money that the town will be borrowing long term with taxpayer dollars. It's 80% to be reimbursed through a grant and the other 20% we're looking for, we were trying to nail down some other grant funding for. So the, the DOT required that we pass this resolution to show that we have the ability to front the money to pay the, for the bills as the contractors um, complete the project and then we'll be receiving reimbursement. So that's why it's a short term um, bond for no more than five years because it, it would only be just for cash flow purposes. Um, the only thing if, if we don't get the second grant we may need to pay for the 20% the match and this would allow for that. But I just want everyone to know we're not using $750,000 of, of town funds for this. Thanks, Emily. Thanks. Okay, and Emily I second it. <laughs> Emily second, and it's a roll call vote. So, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Councilwoman Svensson. Aye. Councilman Ray. Aye. Councilman Marine. Aye. Supervisor Rohr. Aye. Okay. Hey, um, I just, I'm just i sorry, Joe. Um, we just need to revise this resolution, okay. and I'll just need a motion to do so. Uh, and fortunately, Emily picked up on it when she was reviewing them today. Um, that it would be the second whereas paragraph. Uh, the Town of Hyde Park desires to advance the project by making a commitment of 100% of the non-federal share of the cost of preliminary engineering and right-of-way incidentals. And I think what happened is that was left over from the, bar, the prior uh, resolution uh, for the engineering work, but this, that, this resolution before us is for the construction oversight. So that should not no, be No, this there. is for the construction, but it's, it's only for the TAP project. This, that was left over from the phase two, the second project. Oh, okay. It's, yeah, it's fine. So I make a motion to remove, to edit this resolution to remove the second whereas paragraph. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Okay, so sorry, Joe. That's okay. Yeah. Resolution 822-6 of 2016, <coughs> resolution authorizing the implementation of funding in the first instance, 100% of the federal aid and state Marcuselli program aid eligible cost of a transportation federal aid project. And Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 822-7 of 2016, resolution authorizing the execution of the supplemental scope of services for the construction inspection services for the Route 9 pedestrian improvement project. Second. Um, I'm sorry, can you just guys give me one minute? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I just I'm... want to, I just want to make sure that that is in fact accurate to remove that paragraph. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, because we did receive this directly from DOT. Not, not this one, did yeah. we? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So I think we might need to put that back in. <laughs> <laughs> My own second. Because this we received, and I'm just looking at there are eight copies, all need to be signed by Eileen and Mary. All right, well, it's, it's harmless, so do you want to just go I back? I think we better put okay. it back. Okay, so, so <laughs> why don't we do this? Uh, uh, we'll pass the resolution um, either in the form as amended or in the original form as determined by the attorney to the town and the supervisor. Okay. Is that all right? So it's fine with me. I apologize for making. No, I don't. Know. I mean, I'm not just, sure but, what the, <laughs> we have to check on that. Make sure because yeah, so that was their form. That was their form that yeah. we oh. took it from. So <laughs> no over outthinking DOT. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. So do you need Warren to repeat that language, if you don't mind, Warren? Uh, so so we're passing that resolution. This is uh, I'm sorry. resolution six. Six, mm -hmm. um, either in the original form or uh, in the form as amended by um, supervisor. Uh, uh, oh, you know what? I think I misread it, actually, now that I'm looking at it again. It's non-federal share. Yeah, I, I apologize. I made a problem where okay. there wasn't one. Okay. So, so we should just go back to the first version. All right, so, so we just I amend apologize. the resolution to uh, adopt the, the um, um, resolution as originally proposed. I make a motion that we adopt the resolution as originally okay. proposed. And I'll second that. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 That was seven, right? That was okay. six. That was six. Did we do seven? 
Uh, you were working on it, and I was <laughs> <laughs> I was distracted. So I'm glad you caught that. Yeah. Resolution 8227 of 2016, resolution authorizing the execution of the supplemental scope of services for the construction inspection services for the Route 9 pedestrian improvement project. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 822-8 of 2016, resolution authorizing the town supervisor to sign a change order agreement with Dan's Hauling and Demo Inc. for the Green Tree Drive South and Route 9 building demolition project. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Could I just explain that a little bit? Yeah. So um, we did, uh, this is for the demolition of the old garage at the corner of Green Tree and 9G. The town had a contract to have that um, demolition done. Um, when we got towards the end of it, we needed to modify to add a little bit of extra work, which was for our contractor to help with taking the samples, um, do a little excavation so that DEC could take their samples. So we were able to do that within the contingency that was built into the contract. So the final um, ended up being a little bit less than the, the contract that we had originally negotiated. And just to give an update on that, um, so I don't, I'm not gonna go back over the whole thing, but I, I know folks realize it took a long time for the town to negotiate that agreement with the state and the county. And one of the reasons it did is that the state wanted the town to be responsible after, they, after we knocked the garage down for cleaning up whatever contamination might have been left underneath the building that wasn't cleaned up in the first remediation um, effort. And we did not wanna take on that risk. And so we actually walked away from the deal and um, really <laughs> drove a hard bargain to get the state to take that risk. So the state, um, now you'll see after we knock the building down that DEC has trucks in there and contractors, and they did have to dig out a bunch more soil from under the building. That's all being done by the state at the state's expense, not the town's expense. So it's, uh, I, I feel good that we got good advice and we um, stuck to our guns and made sure that was not the town's risk to bear. And so we're actually gonna be ending up with a cleaner site than was there before because there was that unknown under the building and um, they are removing more contaminated soil. Great, thank you, Emily. As we speak, they're doing it. They are. Did we vote on that? Yes. Uh, okay. Did you vote? Okay. Resolution 822-9 of 2016, resolution authorizing the town engineer to solicit written proposals for replacement of the air handler evaporator coil at the police court facility. And the reason we're doing this is it's uh, we've gotten a local a contractor to pro, uh, proposal, which is over $10,000. So our procurement policy requires us to get additional bids. So that's what we're doing. I second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 822-10 of 2016, resolution authorizing the Town of Hyde Park supervisor to execute a street lighting authorization order with Central Hudson Gas and Electric. And this is just for the intersection of uh, Route 9 and West Dorsey Lane. The CIA uh, was eager to see lighting placed at the um, on the telephone poles there. Yeah. So that's, and it will be part of our lighting district. So did we vote on that one? No. no. I need a second. I need a second? Second. second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 822-11 of 2016. Resolution authorizing the Town of High Park Town Board to apply the, uh, to the 2016 Hudson River Valley Greenway Grant Program under the 2016 Greenway Conservancy Trail Grant Program. And Second. All in favor? I, I, Aye. Aye. I just have one thing on that. I noticed in the uh, grant forms they asked uh, whether this is a type one, type two, or enlisted yeah. action. Uh, I think it's a, um, a type two action not subject to environmental review, so we should just make that part of the record so she okay. can fill that out correctly okay. when the grant goes in. So, okay, so that it, so it's a type two, which yeah. doesn't require any kind no. of, okay. Okay. Resolution 822-12 of 2016, resolution approving budget revisions to the Town of Hyde Park for the period of July 2016 budget revisions number 2016-07. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So I just want to point out that um, 
one of the revisions is that we are receiving additional CHIPS money of $43,952. So um, we've uh, talked to the highway super about that, and he has selected to utilize those funds for Cardinal Road. Um, he was already doing Rogers and Covey, I believe it is. Uh, and so uh, he's decided to um, utilize, utilize this additional award for the eastern end of Cardinal. Um, and one of the reasons was because it's cheaper because of the equipment is already there. Right there. Yeah. So the total uh, chips, I think, is about going to be close to 250, 240. And that's the state monies to pave roads. And we were also able to transfer some excess funds into um, additional drainage repairs right. and do some drainage work on Forest Drive this year, which is well, well uh, needed. Yep. Okay. Is it me? Yeah, <laughs> Resolution 822.13 yeah. of 2016. Resolution authorizing town-owned police vehicle and equipment to be sold at public auction via Gov deals. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 822-14 of 2016, acknowledging a resignation of highway employee Michael Yambrick. Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Um, and um, I just was asking Donna if she actually received a resignation letter. She hadn't. So we, we need to do that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. I've, we didn't actually receive a resignation letter. We were only verbally informed by our highway super. Okay. Oh, he's going now. Why yeah. do we just say knowledge when received? <laughs> yeah. Um, but Emily, uh, we have, Emily and I have met with our highway super and had some discussions on staffing. Uh, and originally, we were under the impression there was an additional highway employee because earlier in the year when we were looking to replace a maintenance worker, the um, highway super had volunteered that one of his employees could come over and do that. But uh, for various reasons, that didn't work out. So originally when uh, we um, had heard that Michael was leaving, and uh, we wish him very well, uh, that perhaps we wouldn't be replacing uh, him, but we are in fact concerned about the uh, having enough staff to plow all the routes that um, exist, so we will be refilling this position. But I don't know if you have anything you wanted to yeah, add that? Just, that? you know, that we did have a, a good discussion with the highway super and we made our commitment to him that we would make sure we had enough staff to cover all the plow routes. Um, I know there are a few um, staff positions up in the air because of um, illness and potential retirement and things like that. So um, we'll stay in close contact with Walt and make sure that going into the winter that we have enough staff to cover every um, plow route so that everyone gets their roads plowed. Um, yeah, as absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we, there's a couple items that are still kind of hanging out there that we need to resolve. Uh, the We have been plowing the county roads uh, as well as the, we have an intermunicipal agreement with the um, Statsburg Fire Department. So we're hoping, we're, we're intending to continue those because we intend to continue the staff at the levels that would allow that. Great. Okay. Resolution 822-15 of 2016, resolution authorizing the execution of the bus stop sign, amenities intermunicipal agreement between the County of Dutchess and the Town of Hyde Park, Nung Pro, Pro Tung. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 822-16 of 2016, mm. resolution appointing temporary <coughs> maintenance mechanic for the Town of Hyde Park Town Buildings. Second. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 822-17 of 2016, resolution appointing Tyler J. Peters as part-time police assistant. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 And is Tyler here? Hey, Tyler. Welcome aboard. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for, for sticking it out for two yeah, hours. Yeah, you <laughs> <laughs> You're great. getting to know the town well <laughs> from the beginning. <laughs> okay, well, welcome. We're glad to have you. Thank you. And thanks, Chief, and thanks to your daughter for coming, too. <laughs> <laughs> also getting a lesson in town. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> resolution 822-18 of 2016, resolution appointing part-time police officer Anthony J. Romano. 
And Anthony is out. Oh, well, great. Hi. Welcome. Hi, great. Welcome, Welcome aboard. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for for joining us. Thanks. Appreciate Thanks. that. We need a second. And so second. Have, and all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 822-19 of 2016, resolution continuing the local law adoption process for local law H of 2016 entitled Local Law Amending Chapter 108 of the Town Code to Permit Rural Event Venues. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution 822-20, 2016, resolution approving tax cert consent order and judgment and settlement of the matters of 874 STR LLC and 876 BK LLC versus Town of High Park at all. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Resol um, resolution 822-21 of 2016, resolution approving waiver of potential conflict of interest of the law firm of Thomas, Drowen, Waxman, Pettigro, and Mail, LLP. Second. And that's this is simply because our uh, labor attorney and the is the same law firm as the uh, High Park Central School District uses, and we're trying to forge an agreement uh, for the use of our police officers at the High Park Central School District events. So in order for them to represent us both, we needed a waiver. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Just one housekeeping thing. Do we need to have a resolution uh, continuing the public hearing on Local Law J? Which is? <laughs> is the one, the stale applications? I don't think we, are, we usually we don't, need a resolution. We don't need a no. resolution. A, okay. No. A, I agree. Yeah. Okay. And did we just want to mention the September 11th? Absolutely. Uh, yes. yes. Got that right here. So um, uh, as is the tradition, uh, we will, the Paul Techmeyer 9-11 um, committee will be hosting a candlelight memorial on September 11th um, about 6.30, the candles will be held, uh, handed out, and the ceremony will begin at 7. Firefighters from local firehouse, firehouses will participate, and we hope everyone can come. Okay, so can I have a um, motion to close the meeting? So moved. Second. Uh, and all in favor? Aye. 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 I'm sorry. I had already offered it, but do you, would you, I oh, was sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. Take Herb. back that closing yeah. meeting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm just responding to some of the uh, comments were made about the highway work done in my neighborhood. Okay. Rogers and Covey and Quail. It's absolutely gorgeous. Oh, Yay. nice. It's fantastic. Uh, my compliments to the chef uh, <laughs> and uh, to all of those uh, folks on Connolly. They can just eat their hearts out. <laughs> we have the nicest neighborhood. <laughs> uh, well, thanks, sir. And Barbara, did you have? I ran upstairs. <laughs> Barbara Sweet, 6 Covey Road, Hyde Park. Um, you're into the budget season, okay? Uh, would you please make sure that all the budgets that get posted on the internet are searchable? Okay. Okay? The same okay. thing goes for the planning board minutes and agendas, and the same for the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, minutes and agendas. Uh, our town clerk, Donna McRogan, knows how to do it. Uh, if, they, if people need help, uh, Steve downstairs, he said he would help also. Okay. That's a good uh, suggestion. Thank because uh, when you get those budgets, they're huge and you want to search around for a particular item and if you have to look through each and every page forget it Absolutely. where computers make it a little bit easier sure. okay so steve knows how to do it donna knows how to do it yeah. teamwork go for it okay, okay. Thanks. and thank you thank you, thank you okay. walt for kindly drive for <laughs> Covey Road. Starts, uh, both start with a C. But well, you can think the, the trucks were out there at super. He makes those choices. But 6 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. And uh, they spent two days. One of the one of which was the hottest and most humid day of the year. Uh, but uh, it's all done, and I think the police will enjoy uh, driving through there because it's a good <laughs> shortcut. <laughs> but don't drive too fast. Yeah, thanks, Barbara. And just a further update, I, I do have heard that the uh, county hopes that the 
Um, Crumb Elbow Road will be opened September 8th for, yeah. for school traffic. Keeping their fingers crossed, they did ask for an expansion of the hours that they could work there, which we were happy to do. So I'm hoping that that will, in fact, happen. Okay, so a motion to uh, adjourn. Do we so move? Then, then <laughs> second. <laughs> and all in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, everybody. Double adjournment. I will see you guys at